To be a leader requires one thing and one thing only, followers. That's it. It has nothing to, do, nothing to do with rank or title. It has to do with whether others are going to choose that they volunteer, raise their hands and volunteer to go in the direction that you set. We can force people to do things. We can whip them into shape or offer them all kinds of carrots and sticks to get them to do things. But at the end of the day, a true leader is the one where others raise their hand and, says, and say, I will follow you. The question is, why should anyone follow you? Now, the human animal is like a company. If we want to get certain behaviors out of the organization, out of people, we give them certain incentives or disincentives. We are exactly the same. If you want someone to perform, if you want them to hit a goal, we set the target, we set the goal, and we offer them some sort of bonus if they get there, and we incentivize the behavior. If we threaten someone with a punishment, we disincentivize the behavior. Wait till your father comes home. You know, anyone who's a parent with gold stars or bonuses or all kinds of things, we're, we're used to this. This is normal. The human body works exactly the same way. If you've ever had a feeling of love, trust, joy, fulfillment, status, pride, those are all chemically produced feelings. They're chemically produced incentives trying to get us, the human body's trying to get us to do certain things to get us to cooperate. Tangible matters. We can only, we can only see the things we have words for, right? And this is why the leader must provide a clear vision why are we doing this? Why are we in business in the first place? What is the point of growing the company that you're growing? Everybody talks about, what's your growth? What, what's the point of the growth? In other words, you have a company. Why do you have that company? What is the value your company is offering to others? And, and what, what do you want your company to leave behind when you're gone? There has to be a purpose for why your company exists beyond the things you make, beyond the things you do, beyond the money you make. You had the purpose when you founded the company, otherwise you wouldn't have taken the crazy risk to start it with the overwhelming chance of failure. And people wouldn't have given you blood, sweat and tears if they didn't believe in you because you were the alpha, you had the vision, you had the strength and they wanted your protection. And they joined you and they gave you their blood, sweat and tears because you gave them a sense of purpose and belonging and protection. You have to know why you do what you do, and this is what the leaders do. And the more they can put it into words, the clearer they can put it into the words, the more we can see it. Again, we can only see the things we have words for. And so when you can put these things into words, other people can see them. I have a dream. Martin Luther King put into words the vision seeing he had. The rest of us could see it too, and now could focus all of our attention, all of our efforts on getting it done. And every metric, and this is the purpose of metrics, every metric we use is, a, is, to, is, to, is it's not about the metric. Metrics are supposed to measure progress. In other words, each metric is the tree getting a little bigger. Each, each metric is us getting a little closer to the gazelle. We get another little shot of dopamine. Each metric shows us that we're getting closer to the vision. It's not just about the numbers at the end of the year. How did we do? We're up, good. Towards what? Towards what? We don't know what we're getting closer to. And it makes work unfulfilling. Don't know what we're working towards. Dopamine. We don't care if we let down the goal. Like if we have a goal that we have to ch achieve for work and we miss the goal, do we feel bad that we let the numbers down? No. We feel bad that we let somebody we love down. We feel bad that we let down our boss, we let down our parents, we let down our coach, we let down our drill instructor. We feel bad when we let down a human being. Accountability is never to a number. Accountability is to a person. And if there is no relationship with the person who's supposed to look after us and the person we're supposed to be working for, then we don't feel accountable. And this is where leadership becomes really, really important. You see, when we give selflessly to those in our tribe, offering them protection, because that's all anybody wants at work. They want to feel safe, comfortable, protected. Think about it as a parent. You know, back in those days, there were no countries, there were no corporations, there were no companies. They didn't exist. There's only one thing that pre-existed all of those things. The family. That's all we had, each other. Think about it. What do we say to our children? You don't get to choose your children. Some of them are funny looking. Some of them not that smart, okay? Those are the kids you got, sorry. You get to pick your employees, but you don't get to pick your children, and yet it doesn't matter who your kids are, whether they're the best looking or not, whether they're the smartest or not, whether they're the strongest or not, you give them undying love. 
And you don't point out their weaknesses if you're a good parent. You point out their strengths if you're a good parent. You encourage them to do the things that they're good at. And you hold them up and sometimes you let them fail and learn for themselves and sometimes you discipline them and sometimes you prop them up and sometimes you push them and sometimes you let them go. And more than anything else, all we want for our children is to achieve more than we could have achieved. And we will do that by providing them support, a feeling of safety, a feeling of protection. Well, guess what? It ain't no different at work. Stop saying our company is like a family. It is a family. And you are the mother and you are the father. And the minute you hire someone, you must give them undying love and you must work tirelessly to see that they can achieve more than you could ever have imagined yourself achieving. Those are the best leaders. That's what it means to be a servant leader. Any company, any CEO that says to me proudly, we put our customers first. I always say, then that means you put your employees at least second. We put people first. Human beings come first, not numbers. We sacrifice people to save the numbers, but we don't sacrifice the numbers to save the people. A little bit backwards. And yet when we are willing to sacrifice the numbers to save people, you watch what happens to the people. There's a guy by the name of Bob Chapman in St. Louis, Missouri, who runs a company called Barry Waymiller. It's a $1.6 billion private company with 20% year-over-year growth for the past 20 years. Warren Buffett has 6%. What is Bob's secret? He is obsessed about people. He doesn't even talk about what his company does. It happens to be heavy manufacturing, large capital expenditure machinery. When Kimberly Clark wants to buy a machine to make toilet paper, they make the machine. Huge, huge blue collar, you know, sort of good old fashioned American manufacturing. When the, when the financial crisis hit, Bob's company lost 30% of their revenues off the top. Boom, gone. They could not afford their labor pool at all. And so they sat down and they said, oh my God, do we have to have layoffs? And Bob refused. And so they implemented a furlough program where every employee from CEO to secretary had to take four weeks of unpaid time off. They didn't have to take it consecutively and they could take it whenever they wanted. Those who could afford it more would trade with those who could afford it less. It was remarkable. And Bob told the company, it's better we should all suffer a little than any of us should have to suffer a lot. As human beings, we are biologically designed to cooperate and we want to help each other. When you give someone the responsibility, when you put them in a position of power or authority for their responsibility, they rise up. Why? Because we all want to feel that our lives have value. We all want to feel that our lives and the work that we do is valuable to the tribe. We all want to know that our company needs us. But we don't make people feel needed, needed and we don't make their work feel necessary because we take all the responsibility and we don't let them have it. And when people feel fulfilled, when we make them feel necessary and they feel proud because something got done because they were a part of it, they will give more and more and more and more. People in the Marine Corps are willing to give their lives to people they barely know because they've learned to trust each other. When you show up at Paris Island or in San Diego for the first day of boot camp and you're standing there on the yellow footprints, the drill instructor will yell in your face this far away from you and the first words they hear, the words I, me, my are no longer in your vocabulary. They will be replaced with we, together, and us. They are taught that success does not come by yourself. It only comes in a group. There's an old African proverb to go fast, go alone. To go far, go together. We're all talking about how quickly we're growing our companies. But how long will your company last? 80% of the Dow Index are 35 years or younger. Sure, we build fast growing companies, but they don't last. I watched it. I watched, I went to the Crucible and watched these Marines. The Crucible is their final test before they become Marines. They're out for 56 hours. They get three meals, a total of eight hours sleep the entire time. They're exhausted. They're tired. They're dirty. They're working hard. And you watch a fire squad of four guys making their way under barbed wire and shots fired and all of this mayhem and dirt and sand and it's crazy. And they're dragging themselves across the dirt. And one of the guys is tired and starts falling back, but they have to achieve the mission. They've got to get to the other side. But what do they do? They stop, they go back, they grab his webbing and they pull. They slow themselves down because they'd rather slow down with all four than go fast with three. To go fast, go alone. To go far, go together. 
The next time somebody says, what are your goals? Stop saying to increase top line revenues by a million dollars or $10 million or whatever you want to do next year. And start saying, we're building a company that's going to last 100 years. Watch the changes that happen inside the company. Devote yourself not to firing people, but to give them an opportunity to contribute. And if they fail, help them up. And if they fail, help them up. And if they fail, help them up. And if you really think they're incompetent and you really don't believe they fit your culture, why did you hire them? Because of their resumes or because they belong? We should treat hiring like adopting a child. We don't adopt children by saying, well, I'd like a blonde-haired, blue-eyed kid, yay high, and I want to make sure that they've done well in preschool before I take them. Well, that's how we hire people. I'm looking for somebody with experience in our industry with at least five years with this kind of, oh, you meet it, we'll take you. No, that's not what we do. When we adopt a child, we're going to give them the keys to our house. We'll let them run around by themselves, maybe even give them responsibility over our other children. It's a slow decision. We want to get to know the kid. We want to spend a little time with the kid, see if they would fit in our family, if our other kids would get along with them. Hiring is exactly the same. You cannot judge the quality of a company by the good times. We cannot judge the quality of a crew when the, when the seas are calm. We judge the quality of a crew when the seas are rough. And numbers will never come to your aid, ever. People will. If, you're, if things are going great and everything's growing and you feel that everyone's disposable, <laughs> guess what? They think the same about you. It's reciprocal. It's always balanced. Time and energy. Roam the halls. Implement policies where if you have something to say somebody, not just the exchange of information, if you want to pay someone a compliment, if you want to ask somebody a question about their work, not about some fact like what time's the meeting, you do not send emails. You stand up, you walk the 35 feet, and you walk into their office and say, hey, quick question for you. That thing that you did for the client, can you just tell me a little more about it because I have a client meeting? I promise you the relationships that will, will form simply because people are giving time and energy. It's too quick to send an email. It's too easy. If you come over, if I come over to your house for dinner and uh, a day later I send you this beautiful email how grateful I am for the dinner that you made for me, or if I sent you a handwritten note with the exact same words, which one makes you feel better? The handwritten note. It's not the words. It's not the intention. It's the time and energy we take. And if you think you're too busy to give time and energy to your people, then they're too busy to give time and energy to you. It is a balanced equation. I imagine a world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning, inspired to go to work, and come home every single day fulfilled by the work that they do. I believe that loving our jobs is a right a not a privilege. Why should it be just the lucky few who get to love going to work? It is an entitlement that we all have. And by saying love our jobs, it doesn't mean we have to like them every day. We love our children every day, we don't like them every day. Right? We don't have to like every day, it can be hard, but we get to love it every day. And the thing that makes us love our jobs is not the work that we're doing. It's the way we feel when we go there. We feel safe, we feel protected, we feel that someone wants us to achieve more and is giving us the opportunity to prove to themselves and to ourselves that we can. This is the world that I imagine. This is why I do these talks. Because I'm just a cog in the wheel, a cog in the machine. I'm just a small piece of the jigsaw puzzle. I come to, the, to speak to the, the, the nice people like yourselves because you're the ones who are running companies. You're the ones who are in control of the cultures that you're building. You're the ones who determine who you hire and who you don't. Are you hiring based on skills? You're hiring based on culture. I come and share these ideas with you with the hope that some of you will try some of these things and over the course of time, you will watch your own cultures improve and the people love coming to work. Oh, and by the way, it's good for innovation, it's good for progress, and it's good for profit, aside. So I thank you very much.